Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, and joining us today. Today, we're going to be talking about black women in the economy. And I think that that's probably a pretty good discussion because all across our country, Americans have been having a tough time in this economy for probably the last 35, 40 years, actually. We see wage stagnation across the country. And if wages are stagnated for everybody in general, based on the history and the sociology and the economics of our country, you can bet those challenges are even tougher for black women. Uh, the conversation today uh, is, is uh, one that I've been looking to have for quite a long time. Uh, my name is Keith Ellison, I guess I should tell you that. And uh, I sit on the Financial Services Committee where I'm proud to be led by uh, Maxine Waters, who perhaps more than anyone else in the US Congress is fighting for the family budget of Americans all across this country. Daily in our committee, uh, they are trying to get rid of the uh, Consumer Financial Credit Bureau, which by the way has returned over $12 billion back to consumers, money that in years gone by would just be gone. And I'm talking about the money is getting taken from scam artists, people running slick products. You know, you all know that uh, a, few, a few months ago, Wells Fargo got busted, giving people accounts they never asked for. Then when the account get overdrawn, charge you a fee, stuff like that. Well, you know, she's fight, leading the fight against that. But I just want to point out before we get to our panelists that this fight for black women in this economy has really got to be lifted up and highlighted. I'm grateful y'all are here because when we talk about racial justice, so often it's the black men who we end up talking about. And when we talk about gender justice, so often it's the white women we end up talking about. But what about the sisters? <laughs> and when you think about black women heading households, partnering to, to take care of households, the fight for economic justice has got to be for black women as well. And, 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 and the truth is, is that there was, a, there was a recent study, maybe about a year ago, where they talked about something called a pink tax. Y'all ever heard of this? Well, the pink tax is a, ta is, a, is a tax that women pay. Women pay more for nearly everything than men. Women pay more for car repairs. You know that's probably true, right? They pay more for dry cleaning. They, women pay more for just about everything. It's, 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 it's a rampant sex discrimination. And when you look at the numbers, women are as likely to be a sole breadwinner for a, for a family, more likely uh, than, than men are in many cases today. And so that means it's that much tougher. Plus women also have additional costs that men tend not to have because women tend to be primary caregivers, but also for seniors, not just the kids. Think about the women in your life. How many of them are taking care of their mother or their father or his mother's or his father? You understand what I'm saying? Women are often taking care of two generations at the same time, and therefore, Lower pay, higher costs, sting that much harder. So today we're gonna to talk about black women in the economy. We have an all-star cast to lead this conversation. Uh, we have a diverse group. Now you guys are thinking diverse, they're all black women. <laughs> no, they're a diverse group because you have, we're talking about a little bit of housing. We're gonna be talking about black women in corporate America. We talk about women, black women earning wages in the streets, and we're gonna talk about how certain social things impact life for black women. So let me just introduce to you uh, first, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is here. Uh, here. Let's hear it for everybody. She's distinguished professor of law at the University of California, Los Angeles. Has anybody ever heard the words um, intersectionality. Yes. Intersectionality. Yes. If you've ever heard of intersectionality, you've heard of it because she coined it. Yes. And it is the way to analyze uh, issues of equity. Also, a friend of mine who 
seems to help me out every black caucus and in between, uh, Dr. Valerie Wilson, <laughs> Director of Program on Race, Ethnicity, and the Economy at the uh, Economic Poly Inst Policy Institute. And Dr. Wilson is an economist. She's a black woman. She definitely knows what she's talking about. And uh, another dear friend of mine for years, uh, Deborah Watts. Uh, Deborah, please. <laughs> Deborah Watt, um, and she is the co-founder of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation and cousin of Emmett Till. She's going to share a lot of things with us, but also there is an element of trauma and grief that impacts families economically. This is an important thing to understand and explore. Deborah spent many years in corporate America, wrote a book about it, 101 Ways to be Black in Corporate America. There you go, hold it up higher than that, Deborah. Y'all see it? Yeah, clap for it, it's a good thing. And then also, uh, a, a really a, a, an awesome young scholar who is coming up strong it's really, it's really important that, you know, that uh, folks who've, you know, got five, ten years into doing this stuff, you know, we know that, you know, we, we, have, we have to replenish the struggle all the time. So I'm particularly proud of having Dr. Brittany Lewis join us today. She's a research associate at the, uh, at CURA, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs and University of Minnesota, and actually, um, uh, doc, the, the good doctor uh, is um, really piqued my, and she was, she was a great panelist earlier this year on the Hill on the issue of, um, of, of housing. And a lot of times when you talk housing or any issue, all piece folks want to do is crunch numbers. This percentage, that percentage, this dollar figure, that dollar figure. But she is a, a specialist and has a lot of expertise in that, but also the qualitative realities that people live through every day. Okay, so you're paying 30% more. What does that mean in terms of affording diapers? What, what is the story behind the number? And I think that her research is groundbreaking. So with that, um, what I wanna do is just ask uh, Dr. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw to give us about five to seven minutes. And then after we go through our panel, we're gonna go to you. Does that make, oh, by the way, we're live streaming. Uh, we live streaming, right? Did I say that truthfully? <laughs> Am I telling the truth about the live stream? I got a thumbs up? All right. Oh, by the way, you guys, my staff really worked hard to pull this off today. Can you give them a hand? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Crenshaw, you are up. Oh, may I say this? One of the other things that Dr. Crenshaw is really famous for, and I, I don't know if it's in her presentation because I didn't ask her, but Say Her Name is a campaign to lift up black women who are killed by the police. And the truth is, it's way more than Sandra Bland, y'all. There are literally as many black women killed by the police as black men. Only watching the news wouldn't tell you that, but she'll tell you that. So with no further ado, Kimberly Crenshaw. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honored to join you today, and I'm especially grateful for this opportunity that's been provided by Representative Ellison and his uh, staff for organizing this incredibly important panel. Um, we were just talking before we got started about how many years it's been that those of us who work on issues involving black women, their social economic status, um, have come to these events and have struggled to find space to actually talk about what's going on with black women and girls. So um, I'm really proud to be part of Representative Ellison's posse. Uh, you know, for, for years he, he has been at the forefront of um, intersectional justice. He's marched for workers' rights, he's supported sanctuary cities, He's marched on behalf of cis and transgender women who've been killed by the police and sponsored the Pay Workers a Living Wage Act. So um, this, this is the crew I want to ride with, and I'm really uh, proud to be here. Um, I, I, so today I, I want to, basically I'm going to just talk about frameworks and give some examples um, of intersectionality. Um, the, the, the through line to this is how so many of the social issues that confront 
African Americans in this country are really tied to the economic marginality of black women. Um, issues such as mass incarceration, policing, and more broadly societal punishment. We don't tend to think about social economic issues when we talk about those issues, and then we don't talk about black women when we're talking about those issues. So I'm gonna to try to pull them all together, and I'm gonna do so as basically a way of just illustrating and in some ways reclaiming intersectionality. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I've been reading um, so-called definitions of intersectionality a lot in the media uh, lately. Uh, and I have to say a lot of it I don't recognize as having anything to do with uh, the way I think about intersectionality and especially many times having nothing to do with African American women. And then I'm gonna take it one step further, having nothing to do with the social economic status of African American women, which is particularly ironic because intersectionality came out of an effort to think more concretely about the social economic welfare of African American women. So I'm just going to take a moment and try to reclaim it so that we can see us again. Um, so this is sort of the ode against erasure. So inter intersectionality initially grew out of a case of African American women. Um, who were simply trying to uh, find uh, better opportunities to escape the social economic basement uh, that they occupied in American society. The case uh, arose in St. Louis uh, where African American women were trying to get, at the time, well-paying uh, jobs at auto manufacturing plants. Um, so they, they sued when they were not able to be promoted into some of these well-paying jobs. Um, and their, their, their lawsuit was dismissed by the court. Um, the argument was that these women could not prove race discrimination because the auto manufacturer did hire black people and they couldn't uh, argue sex discrimination because they did hire women. It just turned out that the black people they hired were men and the women that they hired were white. So as a consequence of that, their compound discrimination, the fact that they were being discriminated against as black women, the court said they couldn't prove. Uh, so the, the basic line is that what is actually happening to black women in that moment is being erased by being absorbed within the broader story about what's happening to blacks and the broader story of what is happening to women. And I'll just add this, the expectation that black women should be able to be seen for what's happening to them was framed as preferential treatment. Like, you, why should we be able to put two uh, claims together for you when we don't put two claims of discrimination together for black men or for white women? Now, that was a circumstance where neither black men nor white women had to put two claims together in order to have their story told. But for us to expect for our stories to be told is to be seen as preferential treatment. So, now, that was a case 30 years ago. You might want to believe that things have changed a lot in 30 years. I want us to use that case as a metaphor for thinking about what's actually happening now. How are black women's narratives, their realities, their uh, actual circumstances being submerged and hidden behind stories and narratives about what's happening to our brothers and stories about what's happening to white women? My argument is that if we look across just a snapshot of a lot of issues, we're seeing the same kind of intersectional erasure. Um, the inability to actually have a story told about their social economic circumstances. So I'll just throw some things out and I know my colleagues who are far more experienced and have more knowledge than I will uh, have about these will probably um, uh, tell you even more stuff. Uh, that reinforces the point, but th this is just topical. So um, quiet as it's kept, as much as uh, of our agenda is shaped by the idea of the singular, unique experience of our brothers in the workforce, the realities are a little bit more complicated. Uh, black women still make less and keep less than their brothers and their white sisters. In fact, in terms of wealth, it's getting worse rather, rather than better. Seven years ago, the median net wealth for single black women between the ages of 36 and 49 uh, was $5, uh, $100 for all working age women. 
the uh, National Partnership for Women and Families recently revealed that their average income was $36,000, yet this is typically not mentioned in the way that the pay gap is described. So everyone ranging from Jennifer Lawrence to even President Obama talked about the pay gap for women being 82 cents for every dollar a man makes, failing to notice that for black women, it's 63 cents to the dollar. So black women have to work on average six to seven more months to make the same wage as the average white man. This is intersectional erasure, falling between the cracks. So these are just some of the more direct ways that black women's economic marginality can be quantified. But I want to talk about the untold ways that economic vulnerability is tied to policing and mass incarceration. So first, the fact is black women are also policed. They are also surveilled. They are also punished at dramatically disproportionate rates. But the racial differentials between black women and other women is also frequently erased in the conversation about mass incarceration because there is so much disparity between our brothers and their white male counterparts. But when we actually look and compare black women to white women, their rate is four times higher for black women. Black women are 33% of female prisoners, but they only make up 13% of the female population. It's even worse for jails, 44% of women who are in jail are, uh, are African-American. In some cities, it's worse, 70% in Baltimore, 80% um, in Cook County. Behind these stories are the ways that economic insecurity is even a greater risk for incarceration for women than it is for men. 60% of incarcerated women were not employed full time before they were arrested. 37% had incomes under $600 in the month leading up to their arrest. Now, this is compared to our brothers where it's 40% and 28%. So across the board, it's clear that economic marginality plays a role in making people vulnerable to mass incarceration. What is not clear is how it's a greater factor for women. So beyond incarceration, if we think about push out from high school, it actually creates worse outcomes, worse risk for women. So not having a GED has a higher negative outcome for women. Overall, dropout rates are pretty much similar, but a study in Chicago found that the lifetime earnings for men without diplomas in Illinois is 600,000. It's $400,000 over a lifetime uh, for women. The median income for black female dropouts was $14,000. The median income for black high school dropouts is $21,000. So again, these are just snapshots, not to set up um, a comparison, but to show the consequences of having a framework that's not appropriately gender inclusive. So when we talk about the consequences of mass incarceration, the consequences of push out, the consequences of policing, and in particular of police violence and killings, and we don't talk about it as something that's impacting women as well as men, there are some stories that we miss and some opportunities to intervene that fall through the crowd. So I'm going to end with just um, shouting out um, the name of Vicki Makadori. She is the auntie mama uh, of India Beatty. India Beatty was killed uh, about 16 months ago uh, by the police. So um, uh, uh, Vicki, uh, of course, survived, was a survivor of the killing of her niece. Uh, but she did not survive the ultimate violence. She died about 10 days ago uh, from um, health complications, from uh, stress, from uh, having to struggle uh, to pay the bills, from the fact that people who are killed by the police are not seen as victims of a crime. So the consequences and the cost on families is even greater than almost any other kind of killing. When we talk about who bears the economic consequences, that's disproportionately black women. So when we're talking about uh, Black Lives Matter, we're talking about the struggle against policing and mass incarceration. If we're not talking about black women, we're not talking about 
about a significant aspect of the problem that is undermining the economic security of our community as a whole. And now, Dr. Valerie Wilson. Good afternoon. Uh, that's a, wow, that's, that's a powerful act to follow. But um, I'm definitely honored to be on the panel with all of these ladies um, this afternoon. I would say this is probably the first time of me meeting each of you in person, although I have heard your names and have been familiar with your work. So this is an honor. Um, I also want to thank Congressman Ellison for hosting this panel. I can't tell you how many times at the ALC and other conferences I have done panels on black America in economics. Rarely black women in economics. Um, and so this is a, a special treat. And as a, a black female economist, I will say that in my work, I certainly uh, pay attention to the intersectionality and will often uh, look at disparities by gender as well as by race. Because there are different stories to tell uh, and that deserve attention. So I will start by saying that I think it is impossible to give a coherent and accurate account of black women's economic experiences without acknowledging the harsh realities of race discrimination and gender discrimination. Um, without the two of those, a story just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and I say this because if we were to look at what black women bring uh, to the economy in terms of their education, skills, labor force attachment, and compare that to what black women get out of the economy and earnings and wealth, it just doesn't add up. Um, on one hand, we hear what seem to be all the right inputs. Uh, some of those statistics, two-thirds of black women in the workforce have some post-secondary education. Nearly 30% have a bachelor's degree or higher. Over half of all black women are employed. And if we're focused on prime working age women, women between the ages of 25 and 54, 72% of black women are employed, are gainfully employed and working. And if we look specifically at those with a bachelor's or advanced degree, that number rises to up to 75% or three-fourths. Um, we know that family responsibilities influence women's labor force participa participation uh, such that female labor force participation is typically lower than that of men. But even among women with similar family structures, and that being whether you're married, single, with children, or childless, black working women are more likely to work and work more hours than similarly situated white or Hispanic women. And also, college-educated black women, so again, we, we speak specifically about black women with a bachelor's degree or higher, their work patterns are actually more similar to similarly educated men than they are to similarly educated uh, women. And so in spite of all this, black women are highly educated, black women have strong labor force attachment, uh, in spite of all this, we continue to hear disappointing economic returns. You've already heard the statistic. Uh, black women make about 63 cents for every dollar uh, compared to white men. But beyond that, it's important to note that black women earn less than white men at every education level. So I'm not just talking about on average. If we were to compare a white man and a black woman with a high school diploma, with no diploma, with a PhD, with an associate's degree, you're going to find that within each of those categories, black women still earn less. And in fact, in many cases, black women with more education earn less than, black, than white men with less education. Uh, this the dynamic is also repeated uh, for almost every occupation, whether we're talking about blue collar jobs, white collar jobs, whether we're talking about male dominated occupations or female dominated occupations, you get the same sort of disparity even within the same occupation. So a lot of the excuses that people make to try to explain why we see a difference on average just don't hold up when we look at the data more closely. So it's clear that black women are putting in the work. Black women are getting more education, uh, they're gainfully employed, we work longer hours when possible and necessary, uh, but uh, black women are not reaping the full economic benefits of all of those efforts. And the fact is the economic disparities that black women face are large and they're incredibly persistent. So over time, they don't go away. Uh, in fact, over the last uh, 15, 20 years, we've seen the racial wage gap for African American women actually grow. 
And I think this runs counter to what a lot of people like to believe about America and that, you know, yeah, we had a race problem in the past, we had a, 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 a gender bias problem in the past, but we're getting better. Uh, again, the numbers just don't, don't uh, support that story. And so why is that? You know, what, what's happening here? Um, the fact is that the skills, education, and work experience of black women are being filtered through gender and race biases. So Keith, you talked about the pink tax at the, the beginning of, of the session. Black women face a pink tax and a black tax. So we deal with the gender discrimination and the racial discrimination. And these biases are really built into the structure of uh, social and economic structures of America and it essentially double discounts those skills. It's not that black women don't bring any skills, don't bring any education, don't have talents and, and, and work experiences that should demand um, uh, adequate compensation. It's just that those things are being discount, discounted because they're possessed by a black woman. And in fact, when we look at the earnings disparity, um, a larger part of the earnings disadvantage is attributable to gender than it is to race. So when we line people up, same education, same experience, same region of the country, uh, black women actually are closer to what white women are earning. So the, the racial disparity is actually smaller than the broader gender disparity. Now, the problem with why these uh, issues are persistent um, and why we're not able to do much about these inequities, again, is built within the systems and policies and structures of this country. Uh, on one, the decisions and processes in place uh, by which these disparities play out are largely blind to the individual. So when you are offered a job, you, you are offered a certain salary, you don't know what others doing that job are, are being paid. Um, you don't really have a sense of what the person offering you the job, how they value your experience and what you bring to the job. So, you know, this really stacked against you. And in the sense that you, you believe that you are being discriminated against, um, there are, there's a very high standard of proof for discrimination cases. Um, add to that, the Supreme Court's decision in Walmart versus Dukes in 2011 made it more difficult for workers to find, file class action claims. So even if you had difficulty proving specifically you as an individual, you could gather some others who you know, had similar experiences and bring class action uh, case. But again, that has been uh, rolled back considerably. And then if you are able to file a claim, uh, workers, the fact is workers face retaliation when they speak out against discrimination. Uh, nearly half of all discrimination claims filed with the EEOC include allegations of retaliation. So first, you just have a hard time getting the information, the, the data, the proof you need for a discrimination case. Then, if you were able to be successful in speaking up and, and, and filing a claim, uh, you stand the risk of being retaliated against and, and terminated uh, unfairly. And then, add on top of that, Increasingly, employees are being required to sign away their legal right to sue an employer in court for discrimination through something called mandatory arbitration agreements. Uh, and more of these agreements are including class and collective action waivers as well. So it's further stifling people's ability to seek recourse for discrimination. What we're looking at here, and the reason why these disparities persist is that we're, we, there's a major imbalance of power that the, the scales are really sort of stacked and weighted against you. Now, greater transparency is critical for resolving these issues, unfortunately. I mean, there was a, a simple step that was taken under the Obama administration that would require employers with 100 employees or more to report their pay and hiring data by race, ethnicity, gender, national origin, all the other uh, protected categories. However, 
The Trump administration recently decided to stay uh, that pay data collection rule. So something that would be just that simple and basic would, would have been a, an easy lift because they already have to report <laughs> information, they already collect information. Again, the wool is being pulled over our eyes, the, the, the rug is being pulled from under our feet, and that balance of power, again, is being further eroded. So I'm going to stop right there, but I think the, the story just continues. It's very much connected with what we're hearing about women and, and social justice, as well as women and economic justice. It's just really stacked against African Americans, African American women, and really you have a, a, a double penalty. Um, that really isn't addressed uh, when we talk about the, the broader issues of race discrimination alone or gender discrimination alone. Yeah. Good afternoon. Again, as um, colleagues here have, have mentioned, I think it, we owe a great, uh, debt of gratitude to Congressman Ellison for shining a light on an area that we rarely talk about. Um, as women, we bear the, the load, if you will, and sometimes we do that in a silent manner. Uh, and it is affecting us and in our effectiveness as we move forward. Um, when I wrote 101 Ways to Know You're Black in Corporate America back in 1998, I didn't imagine that I would be sitting here talking about the same things and more. That I would be addressing my daughters who are in corporate America and helping them to navigate their way through, I think, a jungle that um, even myself back a few years ago, uh, didn't have to navigate my way through because the environment and the culture was one where we were looking forward to change. I do want to introduce myself in a more formal manner. I could not sit here and um, <clears throat> not bring into the room uh, some individuals that I stand on the shoulders with. Um, Girl Trek. Uh, was started by two individuals by the name of T. Morgan Dixon and Vanessa Garrison. Are you familiar with Girl Trek mm -hmm. and the work that they're doing? It's wonderful. Well, they did a TED Talk, and they did an introduction. I loved it. And I thought I'd try this today. I'm Deborah Watts, the daughter of Maddie, the daughter of Josephine, who is the daughter of Marie, who is the daughter of Maddie, and who is the daughter of Elizabeth, born in the late, or excuse me, the early 1800s. She was a slave. That individual was able to, as other women, to endure a lot of the issues that we are trying to deal with today, but in a whole different manner. They struggled but they developed survival strategies and tactics for healing that were carried across oceans by African women and passed down to the generations of black women in America. And we used those skills to navigate institution, or they did, uh, institutions of slavery and state-sponsored discrimination in order that we may stand and sit on this stage and with Congressman Ellison today. We walk in the footsteps of women like Rosa Parks, women like Coretta Scott King, women like Satima Clark, women who organized, women who were had, and declared, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Women who, through their pain, were able to display their loved ones, like Mimi Tomoki, my cousin, who said, enough is enough. The world needs to see what's happening. We listened, we've read, we've endured, and now it's time to make a change. All of those women were able to marry their passion with purpose and make progress. If they were able to do it back then, what's wrong with what's happening today? Why aren't we able to do it today? I think most of us are trying to marry the, pro the 
progress and trying to establish the progress, but we're having a tough time because the issues are still the same. One of my attempts with uh, the book, 101 Ways to Know Your Black in Corporate America, I published it. Um, and I was fortunate enough to share the stories of men and women across America who were, in a silent way, um, being destroyed on the inside. Uh, these individuals were talented. They brought their A-game to the table. They were able to move through corporate America. And fortunately, back then, with affirmative action, um, I was able to be in a company that had women and men at all levels of the corporation. And that door was opened at that time. Um, also, we were fortunate at that time to be able to come together and talk about issues and help each other without the fear of being, or any kind of repercussions for doing that. Because we were doing it in the basements of people's homes. We were doing it at the corner bar, if you will. We were doing it in social gatherings. We created these spaces, these safe places for ourselves to make a difference. Um, I don't understand what's happening today and if any of those kind of opportunities exist. But we need to think about that. We were called the Black Breakfast Club. When people saw us walking through the halls of corporate America, and this was at a variety of different corporations and companies, uh, there was fear. Uh, fear that they're going to make a difference. They're going to make something happen. You know, people are going to listen to them. They're going to take a look at the results that they create. But yes, we were ready because we were ready with education, we were ready with our skills, and we were ready to knock down some of the barriers that were there. Now, uh, despite um, our efforts, I know that it, there's a tough job for us right now because in corporate America, we're still experiencing some of those same things. Um, we are counting on others to make a difference. We're looking outward, if you will, at public policy makers to make a difference when sometimes we need to be looking inward. Um, I know that from an economic stability perspective, you know, this is key and important. How many of you are in corporate America? Could you raise your hand? Well, you understand, you know, that um, your ability to move through the ranks in corporate America are based on a lot of different things. Um, they're based on your ability to perhaps have a sponsor. They're based on your ability to utilize your skills in a way that, um, that takes you and rises, helps you to rise above others. And it's allowing you an opportunity to move through, but with gatekeepers that are in the way and with others that are afraid of your abilities, uh, there are roadblocks. Our millennials are faced with many of those roadblocks, and they have no idea what to do. They have no idea how to navigate their way through the corporation. And so I'd like to take advantage of an opportunity to read a, the foreword of the book, 101 Ways to Know Your Black and Corporate America, to give you an idea of how Mamie Till Mobley felt. She wrote the foreword of the book about our progress and what was happening back then and what's happening today. In America, the individual is the building block to greatness. Yet skin color has always been the determining factor in how much building will be tolerated. This book is using satire to trick corporate America into taking another look at itself. Instead of accepting the contributions so generously offered by black Americans, the unwarranted fear of being upstaged has caused corporate America to wrap its ambitious undertakings in barbed wire of hatred, depleting the self-confidence of the giver, and robbing itself of the benefits. Both are losers. May this two-edged sword of truth pierce the armor of racism, rendering it intolerable, making it possible for true greatness to prevail. For true greatness equals true freedom. America, let's not forget, and this was written a few years ago, but uh, we just celebrated and commemorated 62 years, but at that time, she said, 43 years ago, I lost my son in a till. 
I never knew what he would become. His opportunity to contribute ended at age 14 because of hate. How do we know what others would have become? How many other contributors would wind up at the end of a rope? From the loss of my son in Money, Mississippi, to James Byrd at that time, Jasper, Texas, to the loss of talent and dreams of corporate America, much has not changed. The years have passed, progress has been made, but we're still faced with the same issue. I'll just say it, racism. From the most entry-level positions to the boardroom, people of color in America are newly disenfranchised. How many brilliant stars too, are too often dimmed by the clouds of neglect and bias which act to dull their shine? Wake up, America. Not just black America. Enough is enough. It's time for a change in all arenas. It's time for us to begin to work towards achieving true greatness that we so proudly claim. This book provides an avenue for corporate America to start the process by taking action now. I'm reminded of a quote by Derek Greer, editor of the magazine, A Word to the Diaspora. As action without compassion is cruel, mere sympathy without action is worthless. So back then, in 1998, uh, Mamie Till Mobley, who took advantage of this opportunity to make reflections and to draw some intersectionality <laughs> about what happened with her son and what's happening in corporate America. And definitely it impacts our economic security and economic justice is, is something that we need to be talking about. So that, I'm gonna end here and I do have uh, more to share, but um, I, think, I think we're in for a treat for and we'll hearing the rest of what the questions are. Dr. Lewis, thank you, thank you, Joe. All right, so thank you again to Elsa and his team for putting this together and inviting me out. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, as Elsa introduced me, I'm Dr. Brittany Lewis. I'm really, really excited to be a part of this work. Um, I went to graduate school because I wanted to write with and for black women and I love telling stories. Um, so I think maybe that the best way for me to start is to tell a story um, that came out of an interview that I had done. Um, Dr. But, Lewis, yes. it is, it is uh, customary for us to recognize our, our colleagues when they enter our uh, okay. group. Okay. And uh, Congressman Steny Boyer, along with the awesome black woman, uh, Shawaza, who basically runs the place, uh, is here. And uh, please, everybody, uh, give up. Our, our panel is on black women in the economy today. And uh, yeah, so let me just say a couple of words. Keith, I, uh, I saw the title of this was Black Women in the Economy, shared by Keith Ellison. <laughs> there are some extraordinary black women in the Congressional Black Caucus. I want you to know that just in case you didn't know that. But Keith Ellison is one of the most extraordinary leaders we have in this country. Uh, I wanted to come by because I have three daughters. I have two granddaughters and I have three great granddaughters. So I'm very concerned about their place, black or white, women, gender-specific discrimination that occurs in this country. And that's what this is about. But it's also about, and I love this, equity. I have a good friend of mine. He's a builder in Baltimore, very, very successful African-American leader. And a good friend of mine, he says, you know, I'm very interested in equality, but I'm more interested in equity. I want a piece of the action. I want capital. I want to be able to grow and invest uh, and create jobs. Uh, and uh, so when you talk about equity, not only in terms of fairness, but in terms of investment. Uh, you know, the United Negro College Fund has a wonderful, wonderful, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And it doesn't matter whether that mind is in the body of a woman or that mind is in the body of a man. 
we do not want to waste it because we don't have a mind to waste in America. And this panel is so very important because uh, uh, my three daughters and uh, my two granddaughters and my three great granddaughters. I want to make sure they can be all that they can be. I don't want them shut out because of their gender. I don't want them shut out because of the color of their skin. I don't want them shut out for anything other than they're unwilling or can't do the job. That's the only criteria. Content of character is what Martin said. Content of character. Not any other irrelevant distinction, but do they have the character and the ability to apply that ability to the task at hand. So Keith, thank you very much for leading this, but much more thank you for what you do in the Congress of the United States on behalf of working people all over this country and throughout the world. God bless you. Thank you all very much. Stenia walks the talk. I mean, he has been very consistent in hiring African American women. And without Shwanza, look at that. You wave your hand, Shwanza. Let me let me say something, Keith. Yeah. You introduced her. Shwanza Goff is the first African American woman in history to be the party floor director on the floor of the House of Representatives. The first in history, and she does an extraordinary job. And when I'm on the floor, and Schwann's not on the floor, not a member comes up to me to ask what's happening. They all go to Schwann's because they know she knows what's happening. And, and for Antonia yeah. as well. Antonia, no, thank you, Antonia. And so now, Dr. Brittany Lewis, who is an expert in economics and housing, uh, she has a great presentation. We're really focused on housing. I think you all might really enjoy her presentation. Uh, so thank you, Ben Stenny. I'm going to join some of your other colleagues. All right. So we'll be able to stay. But thank you, Doctor, for allowing me to uh, just briefly interrupt. No, thanks, Doctor. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, it's important for you all to, to know that I'm a research associate and I'm in charge of our projects on gentrification, policing, and evictions. Mm -hmm. I'm also a visiting scholar at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank and I do the same type of work in that capacity. Um, so the story I want to share with you first um, happened during one of our gentrification interviews. Um, it was a young black woman who I was interviewing who was trying her damnedest to stay in the central city. Um, and in short, what she shared with me was what she was willing to do to stay. Um, so like what's happening across a lot of urban cities, they're out there pricing out low-income folks of color and they're pushing them further out to the inner and outer ring suburbs. Um, and she said, you know, my friend was really trying to convince me to move out to Rosemont. And Rosemont is a suburban area in, in outside of the Twin Cities where you have your own yard and you have a washer and dryer and, you know, all those great things. But transportation and access to my job is nearly impossible. So she said, I found someone who was um, rehabbing um, an apartment complex here um, in St. Paul in the Frogtown area in St. Paul, um, but it hasn't actually been completely renovated yet. Um, so she moved in knowing that this place was not done, um, paying more than she could afford. Um, it was a rodent infested place. The landlord knowing that he was allowing her, it's almost like I'm rubbing your back, letting you in here. You knew the condition prior to. Um, so if I'm not gonna be um, steadily um, addressing your needs, whether it's rodent infestation, heat, she went without heat during the winter months. Her children were wearing layers. All so that she could stay in the central city close to her job because she does not have reliable transportation. Um, and as she talked to me in these interviews about what gentrification is doing to her and her family. Her family, who is historic to the area, the Rondo neighborhood, is a historic community in St. Paul that like lots of you know, small black communities across the city were decimated because the highways went through. She's part of that family and legacy and she's trying to stay. But those are the conditions under which she has to deal with in order to stay. Those are the stories that matter. Man, those are the stories that we should be moved to action on behalf of. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to spend a little time giving you some, some statistics about the affordable housing issue, particularly evictions, and what we found. So on a national frame, it's been well documented the large-scale incarceration of black men has been destroying black families and communities all across the US. But for black women, eviction has quietly become an extremely destructive force, also wreaking havoc on black families and black communities. And after a woman is evicted once, it follows her forever, just like a conviction. Right? Um, Matthew Desmond, who wrote the book Evicted, is quoted multiple times over saying the phrase, black men are locked up and black women are locked out. Right? And that is what black women are experiencing in the affordable housing crisis and issues of evictions. So although at the current moment there's no national database on evictions, um, and Matthew Desmond is working on releasing something called the Evictions Lab as he goes around to major cities and pulls that data for us, um, Redfin looked at increasing housing cost burden of families to make eviction predictions, and it came up with the following statistics. In 2015, rents have risen 66% since 2000, while household income had only risen on 35%. One in four renters spent 50% or more of their income in, on rent in 2015, and an insufficient supply of affordable housing in many cities continues to push up housing costs, which have been rising rapidly in both the for sale market, over 48% higher, and the rental market, over 19% higher from January of 2011 through October of 2016, and household incomes have not kept pace. Okay, why does this matter and why is it disproportionately impacting black women? Well, as our other really amazing black female speakers have shared with us, they're making less than all of their peers. Um, they are, for most black women in these concentrated urban areas, are single black mothers maintaining homes without the support of spousal income. Um, many are forced to the low-wage sector, service and sales occupations. The national local data will repeat that over and over again. Right? This matters when we talk about housing cost burden. It matters because the housing cost burden for single black mothers is even that greater, more impact, right, compared to any of their peers. So if we take a local, or local frame to the research we've done in Minneapolis, so what we did this summer in partnership with Hennepin County, we did some survey work at Housing Court. So most of the data that is available on evictions does not break it down by race and gender. Um, a, a former report that I wrote um, through the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs on the status of black women economics called for the disaggregation of data um, and like actual state and city laws to force agencies to actually disaggregate data because we are not able in many ways to find the kind of specificities of black women's lives in the data. Um, sometimes we have to create it where it doesn't exist. Um, so we're creating it literally. So this summer we did this twice. In the first survey of 69 tenants, we found one that black females comp comprise the largest group of tenants we observed in our sample. Over 30 out of the 69, this matches national numbers. Black women were the largest group of tenants, but only one appeared in court with representation. Like this is an issue. Um, and when we get to the question of solutions, I got some for you. Um, and the second survey that we did with 67 tenants, black women comprise the largest group, again, of that sample, over 67% were single black mothers at eviction court with little to no representation. The average rent of those that we interacted with was $1,005. Average income survey was $1,777. Um, and the average rent percentage of income was 60%. They were paying about 60% of their income to rent. Um, why? Why are they being evicted? Yeah, Seven. Okay. And the amount you're supposed to pay is? 30. 30. 30. 30. Sorry about the interruption. 30. Right. Some context. 70, 75% of tenants reported evictions as a result of non-payment of rent. 90% selected the other response. Um, the right in response to shows reasons including partial payment of rent, also withholding rent because landlords are not um, keeping the properties up to code, like the sink doesn't work, um, rodent infestation, lead poisoning, things such as that. Previous evictions, 22% of the respondents had been evicted previously, 6% did not know if they had previously been evicted. Um, what's, what's really important about this work um, and the telling of these stories um, is that in telling the stories and in actually meeting people where they are at, 
I consider myself to be a community-based researcher. I do community-based, engaged approaches to research. I do research with you, um, not, um, you're not the subject of what I do, right? Your voice matters. Um, and how you're experiencing this matters, and I think that's where solutions come from. So every mixed method project that we do at Kira um, has that ethic connected to it or I won't do it. Um, so I love um, kind of the one-on-one -on -one engagement I get with these women and I use their voices to help make policy suggestions. So the, the young woman I introduced you prior, who's dying to stay in Frogtown, but living in very um, unhealthy conditions you know, because of it, those are the stories I take with me. Um, when I talk to policymakers or other folks. Um, the last story I'll share and then we can open up. Um, I want us to get a sense of what happens when you get legal representation. What can happen when those resources exist? Um, there were two African American women um, who had a combined total of 10 kids that were facing an eviction court due to an alleged failure to pay. Um, in fact, their money had gone to a series of medical bills and attendant costs that stemmed from lead poisoning in their home. A legal aid lawyers represented the clients in court. They helped them assert def defenses that stem from the landlord's failure to maintain the property in an inhabitable condition. After two days of trial, the judge agreed with the legal aid lawyers and their clients. The judge refused to grant the landlord an eviction, reduced the client's rent obligation to zero, and ordered the landlord to make the repairs before he could collect rent again. The landlord immediately paid for all costs necessary to abate the lead paint hazards and made the property habitable again for the clients. One of the women that we encountered all summer had representation. Mm -hmm. That matters, right? And then you have this story where you have a legal team that you know, had the resources to help these women and their 10 children. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some easy solutions, I believe. I, I really do believe. And I, I want you know, say to say you know, to Keith Ellison when I came in July, Keith Ellison had recently <laughs> introduced the bill that aims to increase the legal services um, to those that are facing evictions. And you know, we hope you know, that there's major movement on that. Um, but those are the stories I love to share. Um, and I, I'm here to answer any questions that well, well, What about this awesome panel you got? Wow, man. I just want to say, when I imagined this panel, I, didn't, I, I thought it was going to be great. I had no idea it was going to be this great. So thank you all very much. Now, um, we want to talk solutions. Uh, I really hate getting together to just diagnose a problem. Of course, fixing the problem, you know, you got to properly diagnose the problem. But I do want to hear from each one of you, like, what's, uh, what are some of the things, in remembering that we got to get to, we want to hear from y y our folks who are here gathered today, but what are some of the things that you think we could do to increase the income and wealth of, of black women uh, in America today. You can just j dive in wherever. Who's ever up first? I guess I'll uh, start. So on the, the wage front, I think there are two, at least two issues that need to be addressed. One being the, the broader wage stagnation and growing inequality between the highest earners and, and the lowest earners. That's something that affects everybody regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender. That's the problem that we need to address. And there are a number of things that, that can be done to, to fix that problem. Uh, again, none of which are currently being uh, pursued. Uh, but when we talk about, generally, we're talking about shifting the balance of power back to more workers. Workers need more bargaining power on their jobs. Um, Policies would include you know, something as, as basic, I think, as raising the minimum wage so that it keeps pace uh, with inflation. Um, a, another policy that we had made some advances on that is now sort of being pulled back was the updating of the overtime rule. Uh, raising that income threshold so that if you made um, below a certain amount, that you were eligible, or above a certain amount, you were eligible to receive overtime pay if you worked more than 40 hours a week. Previously, it had been as low as like $23,000 or something like that. Yet, you know, I don't think anybody thinks that, that's a tremendous amount of money. Uh, yet, you could be on a job at or below that uh, level of income 
I'm sorry, above that level of income, um, work more than 40 hours a week and be eligible for no overtime pay, even though you're putting in many more hours. Uh, the Obama administration ruled to raise that to, I think, about 45, somewhere in there. Uh, and again, that's being threatened to, to roll back. So things that are that basic. So there's the broader structural issue in terms of just growing inequality that, in, that disproportionately impacts uh, African American women. On the other side of that, is the specific issue of race and gender discrimination. And I mentioned that key to addressing that is, is transparency. I mean, otherwise, it's, it's impossible to enforce the law. We already have laws against gender and racial discrimination. We don't need to write any new laws. We need to enforce them. But it's difficult to enforce them without the information. Uh, the other issue that I think would be effective in both addressing just broad-based inequality as well as race and gender equality, as I mentioned, is, is strengthening uh, workers' rights to, to organize and to bargain collectively. All right, thank you. Uh, Brittany, you have a few ideas? So in relation to wealth, um, in 2015 I wrote a report on the state of black women's economics in Minnesota for the Black Women's Wealth Alliance. Please look them up. The report is there. Um, and one of the areas we focused on was black women entrepreneurship. And what I think is really, really compelling about what we found, one, na you know, nationally the data says black women are growing businesses higher than any of their peers. That is true, that is a fact. And then the same fact resonates in the state of Minnesota. We you know, ran the same you know, business survey data to find that it's actually happening in the same ways in our state as well. But what those reports that put the black female face on the report don't tell you is that they're not retaining or expanding any of those businesses, right? So then what does that mean, right? That means that black women in the areas of building wealth are not gaining equitable access to business loans, lines of credit, et cetera, and that's not what's being investigated. Um, I think that's something that we found. We looked at a particular urban loan program, and we used their data because um, we weren't able to obviously get private bank data. So we use a loan program, we coded each of the businesses to figure out the race and gender identity of those that received the loans and for how much and for what, start, retain, or expand. And they are starting, they're not expanding, they're not retaining, right? And a lot of that, and this beckons more questions, right? So what are the barriers that black women entrepreneurs, i.e. black women have been locked out of higher wage paying positions where being industrious enough on their own to start their own business and make their own money. What are the barriers they're facing in building wealth on their own? And it's directly connected to the access they're getting to loans, credit support. Um, in my justification study, I have interviewed um, long-term residents of color trying to stay in gentrifying neighborhoods who are not getting city support. Right, so like the new businesses come in are getting the new business loans, et cetera, but the businesses, the homegrown businesses are trying to stay, right? That look like me and you, right? Been there for generations, are getting pushed out. I think there, there are ways that we can create targeted business loan programs for these black women, for these historic black and brown businesses trying to stay in the areas that are trying to price them out. But that's not what's happening. All right. Dr. Crenshaw? Well, so I want to sign on to everything that's just been said. And, and because we're now a, a, in a space to talk about politics, I want to just say a few words about how to aggregate the political power that mm -hmm. black women consistently show right. um, towards many of these uh, proposals that, that we've been talking about. So. Um, uh, with respect to transparency, with respect to the failure to actually have uh, interpretations of existing law that actually deals with the particular employment vulnerabilities that black women face. Um, one of the biggest political issues that never gets to the forefront of our political agendas is the courts. Mm -hmm. It is the courts that have basically dismantled anti-discrimination law. It is the courts that basically decide that black women, when they fall through the cracks, um, really can't bring cases. It's the courts that allowed the dismantlement of labor unions um, that have been the single most important uh, aspect of, uh, of employment security. So um, when 
we think now about political agendas for the future, if the courts are not on that, then we are missing one oh, of the so most right. important aspects of what we can do collectively in order to address these issues. I would say secondly, um, just simply, it, don't believe the hype. Mm -hmm. uh, there is too much hype about how well black women are doing. I remember a couple of years ago there was this cover story, I don't remember if it was Time or Newsweek, and it had like three of the most famous wealthy black women in the world on the cover. And it sort of stood, it, it served as a stand-in for the idea that we don't really have to worry about them, they're doing okay. So you'd have no idea that at the same time that this is Oprah is being celebrated, you know, millions of black women um, are falling behind as we've heard, even their counterparts in the same jobs with the same um, employment. So we have to be the ones who are prepared to come forward with the actual facts to create accountability structures with our elected representatives so that they will be prepared right. to put our agenda forward and know that there will be consequences if they don't. The last thing, and I, I think this is actually the hardest thing, um, that is recognizing the right of all families, no matter how they are framed, whether they're single-headed households or dual-parent households, to have a minimal income and equal access to conditions of education, healthy environments, and safety. We can't think that the best way to fix this problem is to go find someone else to put them in the family with, with the single-headed house. Oh, yes. Yeah should have the right to have security, economic, physical, and environmental, whether they're, whether they're partnered with a man or not. And frankly, that has been one of the great failures of the last several years when we talk about racial justice and economic policy. It's been a trickle-down um, argument. If we make things right for half of us, it will be made right for all of us. Well, that didn't work when it came to fr enfranchisement. It didn't work at the end of slavery, and it's not going to work now. All right. Deborah Watt, you got some solutions you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things uh, each of you, you know, offered some great solutions. As it relates to, to those in, in corporate America, um, evidence-based um, issues data, facts, and others that are willing to speak on your behalf are so important. Uh, when um, the lawsuit was brought several years ago against uh, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. um, they actually, actually one of those individuals uh, purchased my book at uh, one of the uh, Black MBA uh, conferences. And their attorney used the book because these are actual, it's anonymous, you know, there's no names attached. But these were actual people that um, were able to say things that a lot of the employees were not able to say and to demonstrate the kind of uh, situations, uh, the reactions and the responses that were happening that were stifling their progress. So, so there is some hope, I think, you know, in the courts, if you will. Uh, although, um, I think just recently, uh, I think her name is Ellen Powell, who wrote the book Reset, are you familiar with her? Um, Asian woman who uh, sued um, a law firm, I believe it is, or financial um, industry, um, and she lost. But she's been on the speaking circuit now, but she's telling the stories of individuals, and it is actually waking up those in other like industries and companies, and they're taking a look, they're doing some self-check, you know, on, on what's happening with women, in their environment. But she's actually talking about race and she's talking about gender issues. And I think she's preparing those that are sitting there in silence to be able to prepare themselves to, to sue if they need to and hopefully win. Um, one of the things that, you know, and, and I know I'm a little bit different than, you know, talking about uh, a lot of the statistics um, outside of corporate America, but that's what I've been asked to, you know, to talk about to draw some, some I guess some differences there, but also to talk about what happens within the environment when you have a job uh, and when you're locked out. M women at the middle level are locked out of upward level opportunities. Now why? There's a lot of reasons for it, but let me just say this, that some solutions are. Um, companies need to change the lens in which senior management sees potential. 
Now, that, there's a lot with that statement. Um, back in the early 80s, um, the company that I work for, I know this is a long time ago, but you know, looking at what worked well then and maybe what could work well today, they actually did, um, in senior management, did a race issue, issues in the workplace workshop. It was high impact. It was done by the man, a man by the name of Don Saunders, who actually died uh, performing these workshops. He actually died <coughs> at the hotel because it was so intense. But that intensity is what brought change. It changed the hearts and minds of upper level management. They were able to relate. They were able to see bias. He did such a tremendous job. I hate that he lost his life through you know, that process. But that's what's needed. We're taking a uh, soft uh, approach, I think, with talking about diversity, inclusion, and some of the other issues. We need to call it what it is. And I think those in corporate America need to say exactly what it, it is racism. And now, it, there are other things too, but as long, as long as those things exist, and you as an African American woman or man in that environment can speak to those incidents, those situations, even use my book again, it's gonna come back out again, but um, it, you know, it, it's necessary to do that. Also, um, uh, one statistic I want to uh, mention is that 11% of women in corporate America, only 11 say that they have a sponsor or a powerful advocate that's invested in their career. How many of you are on the mentor level? Mentor level. Okay, well let me just say this. Sponsors have the power. They have the power to make it happen. And so my suggestion is that you look for someone in the company I don't, I don't care if they're at the very top. <laughs> Look for them and ask them. Be able to, if you have enough confidence to demonstrate to them who you are, tell them who you are, what you're about, what you're capable of, where your barriers are, you have an opportunity to hopefully gain someone that, that can at least point you in the right direction. And if they believe in you and you develop a good relationship, you have the ability to have a sponsor, someone that's behind the scenes, that's making sure that you have a, a pathway to success in that corporation. Also, not... Um, I was, I, we do need to get to the audience okay. as well. Do you have some comments you want to... You can wrap up. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say the unconscious bias that, that's within uh, corporate, corporate America and in all areas, I think, whether it's in housing, you know, whether it's in our, our jail systems and our law enforcement system, that's what's hurting us. And if we're not calling it what it is, then we're not able to solve the problem. Um, so I think that's, that's... All right, that was awesome. Let's hear from the panel, everybody. Um, so we want to get as uh, many people to participate as possible, so I'm calling hands as they go up. But just remember, if you talk like 10, 15 minutes, somebody is behind you is hoping to get their question too. So please try to get right there and consider everybody up here thanked. So don't waste any of your time thanking anyone. They're thanked. Go for it. Yes. Um, it's just amazing. You're absolutely amazing. All of you are awesome. Okay. <laughs> as a black woman, like as a 30-year-old woman. We can take all our time thanking, so, folks. No, no. The question that I would ask is, seeing that there's, uh, the court system says there's black and preferential treatment, how do you think in terms of getting state, like local state policy and then like, I guess US policy that would um, cause for task force to actually look at the data? So creating policy that would make them look at data in regards to black women, have you all considered maybe pushing like what impact that may have to make sure that at least if nothing else, that we have numbers that have been like, that have come based off of some le legislation that was passed? And if so, um, how has that been working? I know in Texas, Representative Theory, she pushed the, um, a task force just to see how black women um, are, are treated in health, in the, in the health world. So just to get numbers and data for that. Um, Sorry. But being able for housing and economic Sorry. reasons, do you guys think that having policy that specifically asks just for data to be aggregated around our issues would be beneficial in some way? Yeah, let's do a few. Let's do a few at a time. That's a good question. What about data? Uh, in the white shirt, Mr. Hassan. Yes, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, Jeff Hassan from African American Leadership Point, Minnesota. 
Uh, clarification uh, on your question concerning African American women in business. We've heard that the asset or wealth gap uh, for African American women is actually being closed at a greater rate than any other sector, but your comments seem to suggest that there's something else behind that data when you talk about retention and expansion. Can you clarify that? Let's, let's give one more and then we'll right there, uh, ma'am, in the gray top, the gray and black. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Cliff Berry and I, um, I'm a recent law grad and I work at a reproductive justice mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the impact of the Black Women's Health Care narrative here in DC. And I said that to say that um, even though this panel isn't specifically on health, I've heard so much today that intersects with health, like you bringing up. Um, the woman who lost her life recently, the ones who lose every day to the stresses of um, racism, just a heart disease, the strokes, like the black women lose from that. And then, of course, living in unhealthy conditions and not having an exit. And, I, um, and we have, like, we saw the Senate that wants to cut Medicaid with one in three black women. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. care. And so I'm just wondering how you've seen um, health and economic justice um, interact in your work. And if, um, just some ways, what are some ways that we can like mold those movements so that we're all, because we're all talking about the same thing, like we're talking about just the overall well-being of black women and that is going to intersect with health because we can't, we can't work, we can't do any of that if our health isn't together. So I'm just wondering how you've seen that in your life. Great. Uh, so why don't we uh, let the panel um, kind of address these issues, then we'll try to take three more. Anybody? Okay, so the question on data, you're speaking specifically at the state and local right. level, correct? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I think that any data you can get is useful. Um, and I, I, there are localities that are moving forward with their own sort of paid transparency legislation because it's not going anywhere federally. Um, my challenge I always come back to in that is that the places where it's most needed won't do it. So you almost have to have that federal level enforcement for you to get the broader impact of it. I think it's great if there are cities and states that are you know, progressive enough to take that initiative and, and do it. The states where we're concentrated in the southern part of this country are the least likely to do that. So I was just two back to back. Can y'all hear uh, Dr. Lewis? Or? The disaggregation of data call in the report that I wrote in 2015, one of the main policy recommendations that the Black Women's Wealth Alliance took with them, and they, they're taking on their own advocacy level to push at the state level to the disaggregation of data. It would be key, mm -hmm. I would argue. It would be key in framing the narrative. I think research is only beneficial if you walk in with a social justice ethic for the purpose of changing the narrative, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you need that data to change the narrative. Because unfortunately, some people only talk numbers. Yeah. Right? I love stories. But I understood if I wanted to the story, I got to throw a number in there. <laughs> in relation to your question about the wealth gap, I have not, to be quite frank with you, encountered any data as of now that's sharing with me that the wealth gap has been closed most readily for black women. What I'm seeing is they end up retiring with no money and are negative. What I'm finding is that in our data on the growth of businesses that are the poster child for you know, entrepreneurship in this country, they're not retaining or expanding the need. Mm -hmm. The size of their companies are so small, they can't afford to pay health care, they can't afford to expand to the place in which they really take their families and their lives out of the paycheck to paycheck lifestyle that many are so locked into. Mm -hmm. Right? They want the independence, and many of them are choosing entrepreneurship to gain that independence, to find their own kind of business work lives, and not be dictated in a white power structure that determines their worth. Right? They're choosing that for their own both self um, spirit, their own kind of all those things, but they're not retaining or expanding for the data tells me. Um, so if there's something out there that aims to challenge me, please send it to me. My email is brittany.m.lewis at gmail.com. I don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'll talk real briefly so we can have more questions. Um, I think we just heard an example of the intersection between economic well-being and health. I mean, these women who have these businesses that are touted as 
evidence that black women are doing okay probably can't even afford their own health care. Um, mm. the, the, the women that you, the woman that you, you were talking about that was, you know, living in a rat infested, um, you know, situation largely because of gentrification and transportation, that also obviously has health care consequences. So um, I, I would say that, that if, in conceptualizing it, your last sentence basically framed it. If we talk about the well-being of black women, that is the topic, that's the framework, then the economic, uh, physical, health, all of that uh, actually comes together. And you know, in terms of the disaggregated data, I mean, you know, that's been the issue for decades, not being able to get disaggregated data. So I will, uh, and I will say that it's not just the folks that we're contesting that don't want to give disaggregated data. I will tell you honestly that over the last three years, um, one of the things that NBK uh, mandated was the collection of data. Mm -hmm. But it was collection of data only on men and boys. Mm -hmm. So there was no mandate, no presidential me memoranda that said, we also need to report data on the social economic well-being of black women and girls. Mm -hmm. So if we're not doing it ourselves, how can we expect employers, politicians from the other side of the aisle to think that it's important enough to know about what's happening to black women and girls in order to shape an intervention strategy? So the conversation and the debate is in our own ranks as well as across the aisle. Uh, Deborah, you want to say something? Um, <clears throat> at the end of um, 2016, or the fall of 2016, Michelle Obama um, established something called the United State of Women. Uh, there were 5,000 women that were invited here to Washington, um, actually to the convention center here, to talk about all of those issues. Uh, issues of health, issues of, of, of employment, um, lots of issues. Huh? Were any of you in the audience there or part of the United States of Women? Okay. Well, okay, good. Well, with that excellent, excellent beginning, but where is that today? Um, there were speakers there, there was data there that was shared. I'm not sure who the holder of that information might be. Were you aware of it, Congressman? Yeah, I was aware of it, but I got to agree with you that I have, I'm not aware of any of the follow-up. Okay, so we've lost that. There was a wonderful start. There were 5,000 women chosen across the country that brought their stories, that brought their information, that brought uh, people together with the top leadership of, of, of this country to hear those stories. But I would say that if we have an opportunity to grab that, you know, any of that data, Michelle Chin, yeah. Michelle Chen, I believe, was, was uh, Michelle Obama. Tina Chen. Or Tina Chen, that's right. But, but do, you, do you think that? So, <laughs> I'll just, one last thing. Yeah. When we talk about women mm -hmm. and we don't feel comfortable talking about race, yeah. Yeah. those big conversations yeah. marginalize us. Nonetheless, so it's not enough to have a big conference on women when we can't talk about the fact that black women don't have the same social economic challenges of white women. And frankly, when we talk about some of the programs that came out of the White House Council of Women and Girls, and, and there's not a race and class specific yeah, project yeah. in it, we're not necessarily building capacity to develop agendas that have that confront our issues. Well, you know, Dr. Chris Shaw, that's one of the reasons why we decided to try to do this panel because we've got to have, we've got to start making black women the topic of the conversation or else, you know, folks will simply get ignored. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I remember that Obama did the um, uh, My Brother's Keeper thing. And, you know, we open the paper, we see young black men shooting each other. We, these are, this is a serious problem. But, you know, what, one thing you've proven is that a lot of black women are victims of gun violence as well. Not only community violence, but also official violence. And so I think I would ask you all to, as you go out of this room today, think about how to pull the black woman's story out uh, of the women's story and the black story. Pull up, you know, this, this is key. Um, how much more time we got? Oh, good. Great, awesome. <laughs> uh, right there uh, in the polka dot. Um, so we talked about the imbalance of power at every level in our society. Mm -hmm. But you know, we thank God for courageous men like you because it's going to take men to make that imbalance disappear. 
uh, men that you know don't necessarily want to accept that they have a privilege, both black and white. And so my question is, what are the initiatives that are being um, worked on to get more black women in legislation? Right. Many decisions made about us without us. So uh, absolutely. Great question. And let's take a few more, and I'll make sure I address your question. Yep. So um, I've been having this, a discussion with my friends here. We, well, I um, went to Spelman for undergrad, which is where I learned about intersectionality, which I didn't have to choose there. Now that I'm at Howard Law, love Howard, but I feel like I'm having to explain why I cannot choose. And we've been um, engaging our male counterparts with this discussion. How can we talk to them for one, without them feeling um, attacked, which sometimes I think they're being a little sensitive, but that's just <laughs> um, But also, we, we're going to need them in the conversation. How do you suggest um, that we can talk to them without making them feel like we are blaming them when it's just we're really just trying to get them to recognize um, our oppression the same way that we are always riding for them and recognizing them? Another great question. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So for three years I've been fighting the corporate America about discrimination and gender. And what do you do whenever the EEOC and the EEOs and the courts aren't planning your favor and you're pocketing this all on your own? So what resources does that person have? You know, because with mine I've been paying out of pocket and I'm paying these attorneys. I have good attorneys, but the courts aren't listening either. So I'm at the Fourth Circuit Court at this point in time. So what resources do I have? Because I feel I should not be quiet. Otherwise, people in these leadership roles are going to continue to hit this wall. Great, great. Let's take a few more. Um, right here, ma'am. Uh, and I just want to get back on the numbers, because like, for example, the EPA, the Equal Pay Act for women, that one has a time limit. So like she just said, she's been doing this for three years. That one has a two-year time limit. So mm. if you don't get that in front of the court soon enough, is the statute of limitations go out on it. And then you've got Title Seven, which then it gets bogged down with all that. So I just wanted to put that question. Uh, yeah, great, great. Uh, right, right there. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Nataki. Sorry. Uh, my name is Nataki, and I'm a spokesperson for Let's Buy Black 365. And one of the things that um, we are focused on, and I heard here, were two elements. I'm hearing the racism that's present in white corporate America, and I'm hearing that there are black women who are starting enterprises. And one of the things that we are focused on is taking the intellectual capital that we have that right now is being channeled into other people's wealth and resources and businesses and redirecting it to black owned businesses that have the capacity or can build the capacity so that we're not it, it's almost like we're, we're still fighting to be to play in someone else's sandbox who continues to treat us horribly and then we're going to the court system to try and rectify it um i would my question is how do we actually pair the intellectual capital that we have with the businesses that will effectively eliminate all the problems that we're talking about uh, and what are yeah, what are the resources uh, that can do some of those connections because we have we're especially you know mainly younger millennials and all those who are not interested in continuing the cycle and really want to do something that breaks the chain okay let's take one more then uh, go to panel uh no, I'll. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you spoke. I think one of the questions I had, I had one comment quickly and then one question. The comment that I had was, I came from Fort Bermuda for nine and a half years, and I remember part of the problem was I would recruit MBAs, black women, start a company, and then they would leave within two years. And part of it was the middle management that were drug supervisors of them. And I think the solution, part of the solution could be how do you attach or uh, align um, performance appraisal and in management, uh, middle management, and how they recruit and retain, retain black women? That's just a comment. And then the question about the question I have is: I'm a builder, and improv comes one of my areas. 
and I learned a lot at American women, kids, and one of the things that I um, want to ask is specifically for our congressional folks, specifically he knows and that's not his district, but he is powerful. I'm a U.S. congressman, so the whole country's my district. <laughs> What I push to you and what I push to take away from here, and I'll take your contact information, is how do we frame the, the housing development that's going on mm. right now in Frogtown, mm. which is a lot, and in other parts of the city, including Hunts North, and how do we make the, a targeted group of, say, black women and black folks that are staying in those areas to stay and get a build up? So home ownership. And then the last comment that I'd like to, uh, to sort of uh, say is the bigger group, which is, is there an interest group for women, black women specifically, in Washington, D.C.? And, and then that's a question, general question. Well, I will just add to this. Bonnie Watson Coleman, who's a member of Congress from New Jersey, started a black women's caucus. Now we have the Congressional Black Caucus. And uh, one time, actually, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw spoke to a progressive caucus meeting, and off, out of her inspiration, Bonnie Watson Coleman said, well, let's start a black women's, a black, a congressional black women's caucus. So I don't know if you did, you, I don't know if you know you did that, Doc, but you, you did that. And uh, so yes, there is one, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's moving along pretty well, and they for sure would want to be in touch with you, and we'll help you to connect. Great. So look, let's uh, talk a little bit. Um, a question was asked, uh, what about getting more black women in office? I think this is a wonderful thing. We should absolutely pursue it right away. In fact, in Minneapolis, there is a group, there's a woman named Alberta Gillespie. Any of y'all Minnesotans know her? Alberta Gillespie is, has a black women's group and she's trying to raise money to help black women candidates, train them, encourage them. Uh, I can tell you this, that uh, you got black women who've been running businesses, running nonprofits, doing all kind of great stuff for years, and yet, you know, uh, they st many of them I meet are not sure they're ready. And you meet some young guy, man, he can barely run the Xerox machine, he should be president. You know, I mean, seriously, but we've got to encourage black women to run, it's super important. First black mayor of Minneapolis was a woman, Sharon Sells Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, so what I would encourage you to do, no matter where you're from, uh, just invite some black women together uh, and say, we're gonna start collecting some money and we're gonna start giving it to some candidates who are willing to support black women. Mm -hmm. now, now, I will say this. Um, we, we cannot have a situation where only black women are raising money and helping black women candidates. It's true. It's true. Everybody has to help black women candidates. It's true. It's true. If you're a feminist, white woman, you should be helping black women. If you're a black man, you should be helping black women. If you're a white man, you should be helping black women. Everybody should be promoting the genius that resides inside of black women in public office and in business. So, uh, but the co leadership helps too, the representative. Say it. I said we need leadership help too because it's not just money. They need, they need oh, no, you're right. So we, we need leaderships from people that are in office that can help because you don't know what you don't know. You sure don't. You know and, and, no, you're right, and, you're and, right. And, and just to be honest, just to put, take the big elephant out of the room, a lot of times, because I, I have aspirations at some point, because right. I've been running businesses and corporations and children and all this stuff and kids too. All right. but, but it's like you go and you ask people for help and they're so concerned about themselves and get intimidated because they think of what you want to do. What about the next generation? Because it's not like I want to do it today. But what about the next generation that comes along when you put on your retirement clothes and you just want to enjoy life? True. There, I don't see any succession planning yeah. or anything to try to build our pipeline so that this imbalance can disappear. Or at least can be well, 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 let me just tell you this. Um, I, I think you're spot on, but politics is, is, is a tough business. It's tough. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are, they don't want to train you because they're worried that you might run against them. Yeah, to be honest, this is not a concern I have. Right. You know, uh, I'm not worried about anybody running against me because I never thought that it was my seat anyway. It's the 5th Congressional District. 
I have it as long as folks want me there. One day I'm not going to be there. But one thing that we do all the time is we try to train, recruit, encourage people to come. So we, I'm constantly trying to, you know, train my next replacement. But what I would say is that I'm not sure where, where are you from? Georgia. Well, here's what I would say is that there are a lot of pipelines for candidates in Georgia and really all over the South. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you that we need you in the South more than perhaps anywhere because us folks up north, whenever these companies say we leave it and because we don't want to pay y'all, and we either going to Mexico or we're going down south. Mm -hmm. well, they're not going to go. They're not leaving. They're not closing down their factory up, up north to go down south so they can pay you what they're paying us. Mm -hmm. The whole point is to pay you less. Mm -hmm. And so you got to. So we've got to equalize and strengthen black women's economics in the south, yeah. so that so that we can everybody can get a fair pay. Mm -hmm. So, but what I would say is that um, you're right. We, you you need mentors, training. If you pull together a group. We'll talk about, I mean, I've been volunteer to go down there, but I, I bet you John Lewis would be part of a group that, that would train y'all. And we can, but we've got to have the conversation and we should begin it now. The one thing I'll say, and I'll say this when I met with Alberta's group, which is an African-American group, is that um, you, it's going to start with, the, with the, initiative, the initiative that you demonstrate. So if you say, look, y'all come on over to my place for coffee. We're going to talk about having some black women run for office. We'll show up, and then we'll start talking about putting together money, and then we'll start talking about how do you fundraise, how do you give your stump speech, how do you target, how do you, and, and let me just say this, I won't train anybody who's not about putting the public interest first. I don't want, I don't want anybody in office who is just wants it because they're going to be a big deal after they win. I don't give a crap about anybody becoming a personal big deal. I'm about the community. And if you're there for the community, then I'm with you. And so if you're willing to do that, I'll, you, I'll give you a card. We'll stay in tough contact. And, and you know, uh, and there's groups out there that might help. Like, for example, if you get a big enough group to train, maybe Wellstone Action would come do a training down there. There are different ways to do it. But I'm telling you, it's got to happen because as Dr. Crenshaw has shown, if black women don't raise the flag for black women, maybe it won't get raised at all. But if you raise it, you will have other people coming to help. And I'm telling you, they will. Um, and so uh, thank you for raising the question. And I'll just answer, let me just say this one more thing that I'll hand to y'all. In terms of black, um, in terms of how you talk to black men, right? I think the main thing to say to black men is, don't you want, I mean, how can the whole community come up if half of it is pushed down? And, and here's the thing, you know, um, when my wife was making money, our whole family had more money. <laughs> you know, our whole family had more money. It was a difference between, can we go somewhere this summer or not? And for some families, it's, are we going to be eating beans or are we going to eat chicken? Or, you know what I mean? Are we going to, you know, it's, it's all the difference in the world, right? If your partner's making money or if your mom is making money or if your daughter, my daughter has a job, that means she's not in my pocket as much, right? <laughs> so, 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 I mean, look, that might, I'm not saying I know all the reasons why, but, you, but as a man, you ask me, how do you tell men they got to support black women? Start with self-interest, <laughs> uh, and, and, and then beyond that, just talk about it's right and it's just, and you know what it means to be discriminated against, so why would you want anyone else to suffer that? You know, and, uh, and, and then, you know, use this power of story. One of the reasons I, I, I love the work that Dr. Lewis is doing is because she goes beyond the statistics. She tells a story, a compelling story, and remember this about politics, y'all. A story will go way further than a statistic. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Just one thing I was just going to add about the whole um, politics and, and getting engaged. There are a lot of organizations out there, and I'll tell you, one that's disappeared, kind of like the United States of Women, Future Pack. Future Pack, how many of you are familiar with Future Pack? Anybody? Future, when I ran in 2004 uh, for Congress, uh, the third not against me. In the third, <laughs> not against you. Third congressional district uh, in Minnesota. First black woman that's done it. Yep. Um, 
marketing background. Uh, but I did support you, though, right? You sure did. Yes, I did. But but one thing that that I did I did get support from a group similar to Emily's list. Are you familiar with Emily's list? Yeah. Early money is like yeast, right? It rises like yeast. Okay. Um, but this Future Pack group was led by African American women. It was a wonderful model. Cicely Tyson was one of the spokespersons for it. I've got tapes on it because we sponsored some groups in Minnesota to uh, participate in it. And it was just as you described, Congressman. It was with white women, feminists, and others writing checks and making sure they, they understood what was at stake. The other thing is the value proposition. And I don't think we've done enough in terms of framing that why it's mutually beneficial for black women who hold up half of the sky anyway, and probably more than half the sky, that we're not a part of the whole. So we have a challenge, I think, and that is to frame this sales pitch, if you will, and I hate to put it in those terms, but this sales pitch about why it is important. It's not just an I, I, but it's a we. And in corporate America, they wake up when you can identify, and to the person's point over here that said, you know, we make everybody rich. Yes, I made a lot of money for, for corporate America. You know, the custom calling services, I was a product manager for that. You know, the you know, understanding, you know, how to do call forwarding and all those kinds of things. Um, made a lot of money for the corporation. But I'll tell you, the thing is that I had to make sure that I was marrying my skills with the goals of the corporation. One thing that I that say to people too, you can't take a baseball bat to a football game and expect to run, or excuse me, hit a home run in a football game. So you gotta understand what you're dealing with, with in whatever environment. And politics is a different animal, I'll tell you. It's a different animal. But it can be conquered. And, it, and you should, you know, take advantage of every opportunity to be to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so to address the question about um, how to deal with the obvious challenge, um, I think we need we need some frames and some terms that we can use. Um, uh, I, I call what you're talking about sort of asymmetric solidarity, or if I'm right or die for you, why don't you ride or die for me? Yeah. Um, and, and that we just cannot say enough. We have to keep pointing out when it comes to every single issue that addresses and impacts our brothers disproportionately, we are there for them, right. even more than they're often there for themselves. I mean, look at a Black Lives March, right? Look at, look, look at what's happening with the school to prison pipeline for boys. Most of the people working in that industry look like us. Look in this room, right? You don't see the, the inverse happening. So, in just the terms of fairness, balance, symmetry, the notion of solidarity means we are showing up for each other, not I'm showing up for you and you're not showing up for me. I think um, Representative Ellison is right to point out self-interest um, and also to recognize that for some people, even that economic argument runs up against something else, which is patriarchy. Right. Assumption yeah. that we're supposed to be first. We're supposed to, you know, feed us first, right. and then we'll feed you later. Um, so the, 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 the thing that I will say at that point is we really need our brothers to do this work. We need them to talk to each other. My colleague and co-founder of the African American Policy Forum, when I first met him, he often says, you know, I was you know, a black male endangerment, you know, guy. Um, all of my politics came through the lens of black men being the primary and almost exclusive target of racism. And so I wrote and thought and talked about it. And I asked him, well, what about your moms? 
One mom was drug dependent um, and uh, was homeless. Another mom who raised him um, uh, was on welfare and worked in white women's homes for her entire life without any insurance. These were the women that raised him, yet they were not front and center in his own consciousness wow. about endangerment. So if your own self-interest doesn't allow you to see the endangerment that shapes the people in your lives that are raising you, there's something else going on. Right. And so we've got to have a conversation about what that something else that's right. is that's going on. We can't be afraid to have conversation about sexism inside our community as well as outside. Can't be afraid of having the conversation about patriarchy. Can't be afraid about having the conversation of asymmetric solidarity. Mainly, if I ride or die for you, you got to get whatever is inside of your head that makes it hard for you to ride or die for me because our whole community depends on it. All right. Yeah, really quickly, when you ask that question, the first thing that popped into my mind is the amount of energy black folks in educating other people. Um, and I tell all my students, why whites and students of color, um, that is not our job. Um, that is work that you have to be committed to doing. Um, and hopefully because of your networks, your desire for equity and social justice, you're willing to be self-reflective, right, and listen. Sometimes listening is better than, you know, talking. Um, so in some ways, you need to take off the burden that you put on your own shoulders to educate, right? Engage in informed debate because it's important. Engage because you love your, your fellow brothers, right? But know that you need to walk away whole in that process to do the work that you're meant to do. Not carrying them, or carrying their process with you. Um, there's a question, there's two questions I want to address quickly. Um, a young lady talked about black businesses and she's like, we're always already um, trying to accommodate to their system, right? And how do we use our own intellectual um, work and the work women are doing? You know, I have a hard time thinking outside of the ways that these systems are, that I'm always responding to a system. I work within a system. I work with academia, okay? <laughs> Um, I'm always already, as all of you are, mediating systems and the politics of hierarchy. I don't know how to get out of that place in space. Um, if so, I'd be making a lot more money and I'd be on the speaker circuit. Uh, <laughs> but I, I say that because I think there are ways that I know folks are trying. So for instance, something that's happening in Minneapolis, organizations really trying to push. So how many city-based contracts are these minority businesses, particularly black women businesses, procuring? Mm -hmm. And she's actually trying to build relationships with specific departments of the public transportation, et cetera, to find a self-interest, their own self-interest, into increasing their procurement contracts with black women. Because it's one thing for black women to seek the individual contract. But those big city contracts, right, those big state contracts, like that, what's going to move them out of, right? that paycheck to paycheck frame where they're always already trying to sell themselves. Um, so that, that's work that folks are trying to do, right? And that work that needs to be done. And you need allies to make that happen. You need the keys. You need the commissioners, right? You, you need the heads of a department, right, to believe in an ethic. Um, and I don't know if that helps at all. And in the housing issue in Frogtown, I know so much about what's happening in Frogtown and the housing. You should get ready. Because that community is going to change very quickly. So right now, um, there are over 30 properties that are multiplex that have been sitting for over a year. And in St. Paul, if it sits for over a year vacant, right, it can flip back to single family. So now you got a lot of people coming and buying the properties at the dirt, flipping them, right? And many of those properties where you have a fourplex or a multiplex is going to go to single family. So you're going to be making mini mansions out of multiplex places where you're going to then bring in the people that can afford the mini mansion and push out the black women white men just trying to stay. Like, that's happening in Frogtown right now. Um, what to do about that? You need somebody, right? Whether it's talking city council, you're talking city, you know, city planning department, that like you need someone that will champion your cause that has a position of power to do so. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. This policy, this one year vacant policy, you gotta change it. 
And you gotta have someone that's willing to go to bat for you in that area. And unfortunately, you're always already working within a system that was created not to work for you in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if I gave an inspiring answer. <laughs> 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 that's, 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 that's real. Let, let me say this, uh, and I think, Kim, you kind of touched on this a, a bit. We're having a great policy discussion up here. It really is a great policy discussion. But the other part of what we're dealing with here is politics. And it goes back to the question that uh, the young lady from Georgia asked. We got to get people in office who are going to carry that. It's a lot easier to change that policy, that housing policy, if you have a city council member who's sympathetic to where you're coming from, why not a black woman, right? And so we've, I, I, one of the things I hope we leave here with is the idea that you know we got we got to be running folks for office we got to mobilize the black vote we got to mobilize the vote and you know in this in this last presidential election you know we we ba you know basically you know uh, 70,000 votes in Milwaukee Pil uh, Detroit and Pennsylvania s separated the winner of the election from the loser and uh, actually the loser got more votes overall than the person who ended up winning and I also will say that it's, we talk a lot about presidential politics. My opinion, we talk too much about presidential po We gotta talk way more about city council and state legislative seats. We've lost about 1,000 state legislative seats. When I say we, I'm, the, I'm a Democrat, right? The CBCF Foundation is a nonpartisan organization, but I'm not a nonpartisan person, so I'll say that you know we've got to have y'all thinking about running for state legislature. Well, you got to run because the state legislature, you know, if if you got same day voter registration, it's because the state says so. If you got photo ID, it's because the state says so. The state is where the action at is that every member of Congress, the U.S. Congress, is dependent on the state because I don't draw the lines that I run in. The state does. I don't set up the voter qualifications for the people who I ask to vote for me. The state does that. So I hope you guys are thinking about the state legislature, running for state legislature. And let me just say this to you as well. If you run, I want you to run to win. I don't believe in running to make a point. But having said that, there's value in running, even if you don't win, because you can drive the debate in a way that those other folks who might just win don't even want to talk about. They don't want to talk about no... Uh, gentrification, you know. So if you really want to force a conversation around, uh, you know, housing equity, you might be like, hey, look, I don't expect to win this race, but every time you hear from me, I'm going to be talking about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? When I ran for Congress the first time, I didn't expect to win. I just knew that the people who I thought were going to win, I ended up winning, but the people I thought were going to win, they, weren't, they didn't want to talk about Iraq and how the U.S. never should have went into Iraq and how it was all premised on a big lie. So I said, well, I'm going to run because I'm not letting them get away with it. But then we start talking about health care and housing, and I end up winning the race. Wow, I was surprised. Remember that, Jeff? <laughs> but anyway, so we want you guys to be running for state legislature. And if you're retirement age, this is the perfect time. <laughs> and if you're in your 20s, it's the perfect time. <laughs> And if you're like 40, 50, it's the perfect time. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get some more input. Let's, we got 10 minutes, y'all. Let's talk. Oh, what was your question? Remind us. Since it was about whenever you're fighting discrimination. Oh, yeah. Uh, Professor Kim, Crenshaw, you want to take this up? Well, I think there was also some follow-up on EELC. And um, so, so when I said that... Um, Law is, is probably the silent war that we lost. That's you're, you're telling us an example of that, right? So um, there, there, there were always possibilities of lawsuits actually being taken up more directly by um, EEOC, um, uh, costs being uh, distributed and risks being distributed in a way that, that forced um, employers to be more likely to settle than not. So as the rules turn against plaintiffs, the costs go up, right? So there's a reason why um, you're basically carrying the burden. Um, I think there's a big, a big thing and a small thing. The big thing is 
um, we just we have got to fight to rebuild an anti-discrimination apparatus. Yeah. It has just been eaten out by termites. It just, you know, the outside is there, but it ain't in there anymore. Um, in fact, the reality is that you are more likely to win a discrimination lawsuit if you're suing as a white male than as a woman, a black person, or definitely a black woman. We just need to recognize that this is the reality and make this an important part of our agenda. In the meantime, I think it's important that we have organizations that are focused on trying to make as much as possible out of what's left of this infrastructure. So one of, one of the things that we're trying to do um, is ex explore the possibility of having a legal defense fund that deals with intersectionality, right? What are the issues and what are the kinds of experiences that are falling outside of the traditional legal defense fund advocacy structures? But that takes us back to the other question. Question. Who supports this kind of work? You know, I mean, in, in the same way that it's it's hard for law to figure out is this a, a gender issue or a race issue, uh, foundations are the same way. Uh, donors are the same way. Tell us, are you about race or are you about gender? And to try to say, we actually want to deal with race and gender, and there's a need there. That's the uphill struggle. So, you know, your your question, where are the, the organizations and, and places? I humbly want to say, African American Policy Forum is one of those organizations. Um, the, uh, the the Intersectionality Center at Columbia, and there are others as well trying to do this work. So we actually do need to have. Um, an infrastructure that supports this work that in turn supports people who are dealing with discrimination on totally on their own. So this is almost a, all we have time for. So I'm going to ask all of you guys, give us 15 seconds on what you want people to leave the room with. And we actually are on a bit of a time frame. So 15 seconds, what you want us to walk out of the door with. Um. I definitely have learned a lot myself, even just being on this panel. Uh, and what I would like people to walk out with is to take what you've heard here. I know when we go to these meetings, we get all you know stirred up in the room. You know, keep that going. You know, go to reference the websites, email us. You know, do something. Take a step to keep the conversation and the momentum going from here on out. Keep it moving, Dr. Lou. I couldn't have imagined that I'd be in the place I am right now in my life. I am 30 years old, um, two kids, PhD, and I love the work I do. Anything that you're imagining for yourself right now, despite all of the, the heavy weight we carry in this discussion, right? Don't let it stop you. Absolutely don't let it stop you. And I'm a resource, keeps the resource, um, and I wouldn't be here without you, right? Um, so that, that's what I want you to take away from this discussion. Now, some of these statistics are dreary, right? Some of these make us feel some kind of way they should, right? But we have what we need. I think we just need to believe, you know, in that and not let those conversations that drain us um, make us forget why we started the work in the first place. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. Dr. Black women and girls matter. Don't let anyone tell you they don't. <laughs> hey. Amen. <laughs> All right, well, okay, you got about 10 more seconds. 10 seconds, okay. <laughs> um, remember whose shoulders you stand on. Remember the struggles that they had. Remember that they bonded and banded together to make it happen. When women seek independence, they find community. One other thing, I am not my sister's keeper. I am my sister, and we need brothers to say that as well. All right, good. So, hey, look, everybody, make black women the focus of the conversation. Come up with some great ideas on how to solve the problem of wealth and income. One of the things that Dr. Lewis has been talking about is appropriating money for representation in housing court. I know you were kind of hinting at that, but I just want to make sure we're working on that. By the way, I, you know, we've been I've been raising this with all these folks uh, who got money. Uh, and bring forth your ideas on how we solve these problems. We can do them together. Uh, you know, black women and girls matter, y'all. So let's go get it done. Thank you.
um, 